Are you muted? Have you been muted? Yeah, why don't you do that over I'll again? Say that again. Yeah, yeah. Let's try it again. <laughs> you want to put my picture back up? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Trying again. The matter before the convention is a special order of business to consider two related resolutions. Oh, it's trying to unmute me on my, can, is my mic live now? I need my microwave. Okay, all right. <laughs> Thanks everyone for your patience. Now, the matter before the convention is a special order of business to consider two related resolutions submitted for the convention's consideration. They are denoted as Resolution 1 and Resolution 2 on the diocesan website. Resolution 1 is diocesan work on the history of complicity with white supremacy. Resolution 2 is congregational anti-racism work. Without objection, the chair invokes special rules of debate for these two resolutions. We have allotted 40 minutes, 4-0, 40 minutes total for debate of these two resolutions. The 40 minute time limit applies to both resolutions combined. Upon being recognized, a member may address convention for a maximum of one minute, unless three consecutive delegates express substantially similar opinions on the matter at hand a motion to end debate shall not be in order. Once debate has ended for resolution one, the clock will stop and will restart with debate on resolution two. A clock will be shown on your screen for informational purposes. Votes on each resolution will occur at the conclusion of this special order of business. We begin with resolution one. The chair calls on the Reverend Hillary Cook to speak to the resolution, Res resolution one. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, copies of the resolutions may be found on the diocesan website, as you can't see all the text on the screen. And I'd like to invite Marianne Scott to speak to resolution number one, please. Thank you, Hillary. The Indianapolis chapter of the Union of Black Episcopalians offers this resolution in the spirit of remembrance, forgiveness, and reconciliation. As the saying goes, those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it. This resolution asks for our members, congregations, and dioceses to commit to learning and hearing the truths of the ways we have been historically complicit through commission and omission in acts of prejudice, discrimination, racism, and systemic oppression that have negatively impacted black and brown persons, both within our own congregations and ministries, and also in our local communities. As Archbishop Desmond Tutu said, and I quote, true reconciliation exposes the awfulness, the abuse, the hurt, the truth. It could even sometimes make things worse. It is a risky undertaking, but in the end, it is worthwhile because in the end, only an honest confrontation with reality can bring real healing. Superficial reconciliation can bring only superficial healing, end quote. As Canon Speller said earlier, Living into the Jesus movement also means deep, brave listening to our truths and our pain. Thank you for your time and consideration, and I ask for passage of this resolution. I'll remind the convention that in order to speak to this resolution, please use the raised hand function in Zoom. Your microphone will be unmuted at the time you are recognized. Is there a discussion? The chair recognizes C. Davies Reed. Please introduce yourself by name and parish. I'm uh, the Reverend C. Davies Reed. I'm the rector of St. Francis in the Fields Episcopal Church in Zionsville, Indiana. And I uh, rise in support of this uh, with a very specific point to make. And that is from the position of the budget this resolution calls for uh, funding of $25,000, which is not currently in the 2021 budget, but uh, we have discussed it at least marginally at this point and believe that funding can be secured through various sources. 
So that should neither affect the passage of this uh, resolution, which I support, nor the passage of the budget, which will come uh, later today, but not in its current form, include funding for this measure. Thank you. Thank you. The chair recognizes Tim Jensen. Yes, my name is Tim Jensen from All Saints Indianapolis, and I also rise in support of this resolution and in support of this resolution as presented. Um, this is not going to be easy work. This is important work, but as our bishop has spoken during her sermon today, it's uh, there's history that we don't all fully understand in this diocese of what has come before us, and we can't go forward with reconciliation and growth unless we learn this history. And so it is very important for us as parishes, uh, regardless of how painful or deep or or things like this, uh, our history uh, will be that we discover, but we need to go through and learn this history in order to move forward. So thank you. Thank you. Is there further discussion? Chair recognizes Kimberly Applegate. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, I also raise, uh, rise in support of the resolution having um, completed the sacred ground uh, course. And I can't say enough positive about the experience. Um, and I think that it is really essential that we um, do what we can and pass this resolution uh, along with the others coming up to discuss. Thank you. Remind the body that please, each time you are recognized by the bishop to please share your name and the congregation you represent. I'm sorry about that. I'm from St. Francis. Um, in Zionsville. Thank you. Thank you. The chair recognizes Michael McGraw. Michael, you're on mute. My name is Michael McGraw. I'm a delegate from St. Francis and Field, Zionsville, and also participate with St. Philip's Envy. I'm secretary of the Indianapolis diocesan chapter of Union of Black Episcopalians and I rise in support of this resolution and want to point out that this is one step of how we become beloved community. Thank you. Thank you. The chair sees that there are several folks lining up to speak. Before proceeding, if you are speaking to in favor of the resolution, I'm going to invite you to lower your hand. At this point, we've had four um, speakers in support of the resolution, and I wanna make space if there are any who are speaking uh, against the resolution. And the hands go down, okay. Give it another moment. Is there anyone who wants to speak against this resolution. I think if the um, folks who had lined up previously have anything substantially different to add, please raise your hand again and I will recognize you. If you are affirming what has already been spoken, I will ask you to um, hold your peace. Is there anyone with a different perspective to add? I'm looking for the raise hand function. Okay. It would seem to me that we are prepared to vote on this resolution at this time. And so I will call on Brendan. Can Brendan will be will be doing this as a poll? Let me just double check this. Yes, Bishop, I believe we will do this as a poll. Great, I'd like to recognize Canon Brendan O'Sullivan-Hale to lead us in this vote. Thank Let me you, stop Bishop. the clock, thank you. 
Um, this vote is not by orders. It requires a simple majority. So if you are eligible to vote, please vote now. The vote will remain open for 10 more seconds. Oh, the pressure. The vote is closed. The resolution passes. Thank you very much. The chair calls on the Reverend Hillary Cook to speak to resolution number two. Thank you, Bishop. I will defer to the Reverend Gray Lassane to present this one. The chair recognizes Gray Lassane. Thank you, Madam President. The Indianapolis chapter of the Union of Black Episcopalians, of which I am a member, submits this resolution to today in the hopes that our diocese will affirm the dignity of black lives that have historically been in danger and that are in this current moment in danger. We submit this resolution not as a political statement, but rather as a theological statement and as a response rooted in our baptismal covenant. We hope that this resolution will empower us not just to say the words of the great commandment, but to be active doers in living out the great commandment in loving our neighbors as ourselves, as Canon Spellers taught us this morning. The proposed resolution continues the work of truth telling we have begun today in resolution one by asking that every congregation and canonically resident clergy person take some meaningful next step toward racial reconciliation and healing. By saying yes to this resolution, we are saying as a collective body that healing the wounds of systemic racism is a priority for us mutually over the course of the next year. And we commit to holding each other accountable for this work. The intent of this resolution is to engage each of our congregations and clergy where we are and to ask each of us, as you said in your uh, sermon today, to take a bold next step and then to share our experiences across the diocese. How this will play out in our diocese is as different as each congregation. Um, please know that the UBE and our newly reformed racial healing and reconciliation team stand ready with resources and ideas and we are ready to be brainstorming partners. We ask for consent to this resolution because this is holy work that we should and can start now for which we can hold each other accountable and in which we can be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ who are beacons of hope for the communities that we serve. Thank you. Reverend Dr. Gray Lassane, may you please remind us of your congregation. Uh, thank you. Good Samaritan in Brownsburg. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Is there discussion on resolution two? I'll invite you to use the raise hand feature and the chair recognizes Alan Rutherford. Um, in the second uh, paragraph of resolution two, uh, the second Excuse line. Me, uh, please state your name and your congregation. Uh, Reverend Alan Rutherford, St. John's Episcopal Church, Mount Vernon, Indiana. Uh, in, on the second resolution in the uh, second paragraph, second line, uh, I would like to amend and strike the words alt-right and, but at the end of white supremacy, put the word groups. So it would read, including those expressions by white supremacy groups. And the reason that I want to strike uh, alt-right is that it kind of smacks of uh, political jargon. And um, I don't think it, uh, uh, fits in this resolution. I think that condemning me, Alan? all Alan? whites Alan? Groups is fine. Could you mute him, please? Yeah. Alan. Huh? And um, this is addressed to all members of convention. The protocol is if you would like to offer an amendment that you offer the amendment, you are not allowed to immediately speak to it <laughs> unless I, until it's been put into play. So you've put an amendment on the floor and it is appropriate to call for a second to the amendment. As we do so, I want to check to see that you have offered this amendment in um, email form or writing form so that we can put it on the screen for all to view. Have you done so?
if we can unmute Alan Rutherford. Alan, have you submitted this in writing already? Uh, no, uh, in, in the chat or where, how? We're asking that you, um, let's see, can we do the chat? I don't, I'm going to call on Brendan O'Sullivan Hale to guide us in the offering of this amendment. Thank you, and Bishop. Brendan, um, our preference would be that you send the amendment via email to um, Kim Christopher at Christopher at indiedio.org um, so that we can make absolutely clear what the proposed change in wording is for the benefit of convention. As Alan Rutherford makes um, that amendment and, and moves it forward, I will note that we will, um, after we have the wording of the amendment, we will be seeking a second to, in order for us to consider it. We do have a second? Yeah, that is appropriate in the chat, correct? Great, yes, we have a second that's been given in the chat. And so um, we'll be able to move to discussion once it is available for view. And then Alan Rutherford, you'll have the opportunity to speak to the amendment. This is the place in our convention proceedings where we would have hoped to have had a dance party, but that is not going to be possible for us right now, <laughs> unfortunately. Right there in the middle of the afternoon, huh? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Why not? <laughs> Durand, Durand. Durand, exam oh my gosh, I should be checking the chat apparently. That's where the action yeah. is. We could put on some Duran Duran, that's right. There's a question about if we're still running the time of debate. I don't know that we started the clock for debate yet. On the we Did it? Okay. Okay. Oh, there it is. All okay. right. Yeah. Might you pause it right now? Thank you. Because we're, go we're moving through some time. So just to let the convention know, we are pausing the clock as we work through um, the, you know, the internet <laughs> to get a, an email to fall into Brendan's box, to Kim Christopher's box for her to be able to bring to us to share on the screen. You can see why conducting parliamentary procedure by Zoom takes a moment. So appreciate your patience. It has been sent. The email has been sent. Oh, Tim Jensen. I'm going back to the chat. Thank you, Alan. Mm -hmm. I can tell that there's some Gen Xers in the house calling for in excess. <laughs> May Michael Hutchins rest in peace. My favorite groups are on being called <laughs> out. <Wyatt. Jer> <laughs> We can see that the diocesan playlist for the next, uh, the 184th convention is being put together in the chat. It's great. <laughs> I have the amendment um, and I'm uh, ready to. Great, uh, you're ready? Yeah, okay. And I'll, I'll show it on my screen here in just a moment. Okay, one more moment. <laughs> yeah, the, the cure, who's talking about the cure? Uh, oh, Seddon. Matt Seddon. Don't stop believing, Debbie Day Lewis. <laughs> I could invite you all to do, do the electric slide on your own, wherever you may be Zooming from while we wait. <laughs> Feel free. <laughs> I, however, need to remain seated because I'm the chair. 
Okay. All right. He, I do believe we have the amendment up on the screen. I'm going to call on dispatch to read the um, um, amendment for us. Dispatch. Resolved. Alive. Resolved that this 183rd convention of the Episcopal Diocese of Indianapolis decries every form and expression of racism and white supremacy, including those expressions by white supremacist groups, the Ku Klux Klan, Christian identity adherence, white nationalism, and neo-Nazism as antithetical to the gospel of Jesus Christ, and be it further, etc. Thank you, Ken and Kristen. Is there any discussion on the amendment? Alan Rutherford, I believe you um, presented the, the amendment, but now it is you are in order if you'd like to speak to it. Um, uh, the only thing that I don't like about the alt-right is it kind of, we have this, this jargon of alt-right, alt-left, and uh, I don't think uh, this is the place to be putting in that kind of jargon. And uh, just make it very um, inclusive of all white supremacist groups um, and leave it at that. All right, thank you. The chair recognizes Erin Hoagland. Please state your name and congregation. Thank you, Bishop. Yes, um, my name is Reverend Erin Hoagland. Um, I'm at Trinity Indianapolis. Um, I want to point out that uh, this may be a matter of, um, and it feels important to actually recognize the definition of alt-right. If you go to the Southern Poverty Law Center's website, they provide a definition here that says, the alternative right or alt-right, commonly known as the alt-right, is a set of far-right ideologies, groups, and individuals whose core belief is that white identity is under attack by multicultural forces using political correctness and social justice to undermine white people and their civilization. civilization. The alternate right is characterized by heavy use of social media and online memes, alt-right writer, alt writers, a skew establishment, conservatism, skew young and embrace white ethonationalism as a fundamental value. Um, I think it's important to leave um, alt-right in the amendment um, because it does speak to the fact that the alt-right has been uh, fueling uh, white nationalism in this country, especially recently, and it is an important point of conversation and education for us, especially as white folks in the in our congregations and communities. Um, and it, um, yeah, I think that's that's all I have to say about that. I think it is important to leave it in there and know actually what the definition is that this is not Republican attacking. So to clarify, you are speaking against the amendment. No. Uh, or yes, the, against the amendment. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, to clarify, thank you. Thank you. The next person in the queue is Amy Dobbs. Please stay, I'm gonna add a little more homework for y'all. Your name, your congregation, and for the reason you rise to speak for or against the amendment that's on the floor. Hi, I'm Amy Dobbs. I'm from Good Samaritan Episcopal Church. Um, and I rise in um, to oppose the amendment. Um, as as Aaron said, the, the alt right is not synonymous with right wing political beliefs. Um, it uses the um, trappings of right wing political beliefs to forward hate speech and bigotry. Um, and we are specifically speaking to alt right white supremacy. There's certainly more to that movement, um, which we're not going to get into here, but I think it's entirely appropriate to address the white supremacist component of those movements. Um, some, depending on the specific group, some are more or less, um, you know, white supremacists specifically. Um, and that's, that's what we're addressing here. Um, the, the, the wording of the resolution states every form and expression of racism and white supremacy, including, so we're stating specific groups that we would like to call out as um, antithetical to, to our beliefs. So 
um, I think it would water it down to change the wording to white supremacist groups because that's already kind of implied by the wording of the rest of, of that paragraph. Thank you. The chair recognizes Jeffrey Dreyer. Uh, hello, I'm Jeffrey Dreyer. I'm part of the youth delegation. Just got my vote, gonna use it. Uh, I'm from Good Samaritan in Brownsburg and I'm speaking against, is that everything? Am I? That's right, you're great. Okay. All right, good. So uh, in, our current, in the current state of our nation, uh, jargon is a term that could be used almost ubiquitously from uh, both sides, right? Everybody has, everybody has just a whole list of words that we use, and I don't think we should really be limiting uh, the language that we use to condemn uh, white supremacy. Uh, so using, using jargon and using uh, politics, especially like uh, the political stance, uh, and denying the clear political stance that this takes is to be willfully ignorant. Uh, and I, my second point is that white supremacy is not limited to just physical groups. It's not limited to groups. White supremacy is an opinion. It's a mental being that has to be combated in every circumstance that it occurs. So if we, even if we are, if we are taking, if we're saying white supremacy as a group is bad, that's great, right? But we can't, we can't stop there because even if they aren't organizing, they still believe it. And that's not, that's not far enough. We have to, we have to erase that. That's my. Uh, Thank you so much, Jeffrey. That's my deal. Thank you. The chair recognizes Tim Culbertson. Thank you. Uh, Madam President, this is Tim Culbertson from Christchurch Cathedral. I rise in opposition to the amendment. I believe it would weaken the resolution to leave out one of the leading labels that has um, been applied and generally self-applied to groups of white ethno um, supremacy. Uh, that this alt-right was uh, coined by a member of one of these groups and I think is one of the uh, leading labels used both within and without of uh, the movement to to apply to uh, white supremacy movements today. So I think we would uh, do a disservice to the intent of the resolution to leave out that particular group. Thank you. Thank you. We have now had several speakers rise to speak against the amendment. I would now like to see whether anyone in the queue desires to speak for the amendment. If you are rising to speak against the amendment, I'm going to ask you to lower your hand in the Zoom app so that I can see who wants to speak for the amendment. I'll just give it a, a, a few moments here. Okay, the chair recognizes Didier Bertrand. Hi, um, I'm, I'm Didier Bertrand uh, from All Saints, Indianapolis, and I would like to be uh, to pronounce myself in favor of the amendment for the reasons the, um, the proposer uh, mentioned. Um, I, although I am very, very, I, am, I understand very well the, um, everybody's um, uh, points and I respect them, it seems to me that um, the, you know this this is a very very uh, polarized time. Alt right is political, and I think, uh, like the the proposer of the amendment, that uh, it does not belong in a uh, in a in a faith statement. And further, I think uh, the rest of the of the um, text makes it clear that all right is is kind of you know written between the lines. And I think that's enough. Thank you. Thank you. The chair recognizes Ricardo Bello Gomez. Thank you, Bishop Jennifer. I'm Ricardo Bello Gomez from the Episcopal Campus Ministry at Indiana University, Canterbury House. Uh, I would like to speak on uh, support of the amendment. Well, uh, 
as Didier just mentioned, I think uh, even though it, it doesn't relate to the whole spectrum of uh, right-leaning thinking, alt right still represents a particular, a very extremist position in the political spectrum. And I think it is it's a little complicated if we are going to include alt right, but not recognize that on the alt left in the very extreme side, the other extreme of the political spectrum, there are also um, white supremacist expressions, particularly related to uh, anti-Semitism, for instance. And if, if we are going to denounce all expressions of hate and racism as we, I think we have, we are doing a disservice if, if we are just highlighting one of the political extremes on not both. And in order to just leave it in a more clear and broadly uh, stated, I think the amendment is going to, to help us do that. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no one else in the queue, I'm going to call on dispatch to read the resolution one more time and it's the amendment, excuse me. It seems that we may be prepared to vote. Dispatch. Yes, Bishop. The amendment to the resolution, the amended resolution reads as, as this. Resolved that this 183rd convention of the Episcopal Diocese of Indianapolis decries every form and expression of racism and white supremacy, including those expressions by white supremacist groups, the Ku Klux Klan, Christian identity adherents, white nationalism and neo-Nazism as antithetical to the gospel of Jesus Christ and be it further, et cetera. Thank you. I call on Canon Brendan O'Sullivan Hale to conduct the vote on the amendment. Thank you, Bishop. Give me one moment. The vote is to amend the resolution. So a vote for is to amend the resolution. The vote against is not to amend the resolution. We are not voting on the resolution at this time, merely on the amendment. Please vote now. The vote will remain open for 10 more seconds. The vote is closed. The chair calls on dispatch of business. By a vote of uh, 44 for the amendment and 102 against the amended version of the resolution, the amendment does not carry. Thank you, dispatch. The amendment fails and so we return to the resolution on the floor. Is there any discussion? The chair recognizes Rachel Allen. Hi, I'm Rachel Allen from St. Thomas and Franklin. I am speaking um, for clarification on the resolution. Uh, forgive my ignorance, but I don't know what Christian identity adherents are. Uh, so I would appreciate uh, a definition of that, please. Thank you. The chair calls on Hillary Cook or Marion Scott, whoever would like to take up that question for clarification. This is Mary Ann Scott. Um, I attend uh, St. Timothy's Indianapolis. Um, I would like to throw that to Gray, uh, Reverend Gray Lassane. The chair recognizes Reverend Gray Lassane. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, all of these uh, supremacist groups uh, that are in this part of the resolution uh, come to us from 
uh, the Anti-Defamation League and the Southern Poverty Law Center, which study and track the movement of hate groups. Uh, so the Christian identity uh, movement is a re religious ideology popular uh, that believes that whites of European descent can be traced back to the lost tribes of Israel. So all of the different groups that you're seeing today in these resolutions represent different active white supremacist groups, uh, which we want to find as a repudiation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Gray. Um, Rachel Allen, does that suffice? Yes, it does, thank you. You're welcome. The chair recognizes Evelyn Wheeler. Hey, I have a clarification question Evelyn, also. Pardon me, Evelyn, please share your name your name, yes. your congregation, and speaking for or against the resolution. I was so excited. Um, Evelyn Wheeler, priest at Christ Episcopal Church, Madison, Indiana, and I am speaking on a point of clarification, please. And that is in the fourth, one, two, three, yes, the fourth paragraph, the fourth resolved, um, directing the congregations to do this work, and it finishes up, um, well, the work they have, they have done between said dates in dismantling systemic racism through storytelling, community listening, and engagement with civic organizations and partner religious institutions. Is that list intended to be either um, directive or all-inclusive? Could there be other activities or all those activities required? The chair recognizes Canon Gray Lassane. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, the, the, uh, the resolution as we have crafted it uh, gives wide latitude to both congregations and clergy to engage in activities that seem appropriate for you and for your context. Um, so these are not prescriptive, but merely suggestive. Thank you. May I? Okay. Did you, uh, yes, Evelyn, did you have a follow-up? Yes, I would have a follow-up. I am wondering, and I, I am prepared to type out if, if required to state that it is indicative but not prescriptive. If you would like to offer an amendment to this resolution, please send your amendment by email to Christopher at indiedio.org. Virginia Hall. Virginia Hall, I'd like to recognize you to speak, but we're having trouble unmuting you, I believe. There you go. Can you speak up to just a little bit so we can all hear you? If you can you hear me now? Here we go, yes, thank you. Um, Reverend Virginia Hall, Trinity Bloomington. Um, I mean, We've had a real live experience of, of opposition to free speech related to um, various um, alleged white supremacy groups in our farmer's market over the past year. It has split the community terribly. And my concern is as we identify group, speak with each other. Um, that we maintain uh, relationships, that we try to understand and not demonize someone for their position. And I understand our gospel stance, support it, but I'm, uh, that's. I'm sorry, Virginia, your internet seems to be unstable. Can you let us know whether you're speaking for or, or against this resolution? I am speaking for the resolution with an, uh, a caveat about an experience we've had of great division 
here in Bloomington over these issues and the way we treat each other when we do stand in different camps. Thank you. Thank you. Is that clear? It, it, it is. It seems to me that you are just making a comment, but not wanting to issue an amendment on your caveat. So I think we received your, I think we all heard the essence of your comment. Thank you. The chair recognizes Frank Apichake. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm Frank Kempichike. I'm the rector at St. Matthew's Episcopal Church in Indianapolis. I rise to speak for the amendment, or excuse me, to speak for the resolution um, unamended. I, uh, I believe this is long overdue. In fact, um, we were talking about this before I ever became and was received as an Episcopalian. Um, I appreciate the resolution. I like a lot the, the variety that churches can do to, to, to fit where they are and, and things that fit in their congregation. And I appreciate the accountability that is built into this resolution. Thank you. Thank you. The chair recognizes Les Leslie McKellar. Hi, I'm Leslie McKellar with St. Francis in the field Zionsville, and I'm going to probably just build off of what uh, Father Frank said. Uh, I'm very much in support of this resolution. I think it gives all of us who've been struggling with, uh, yeah, I'm reading about this issue and what have you, but what can we actually do? Gives us some great examples while still giving us the opportunity to figure out what that means within our own congregations. Where are we in this journey? And I love the fact that it builds in some accountability. So very much in support. Thank you. Thank you. The chair recognizes Wendy Crito. Hi, um, I would like to rise in favor of this uh, resolution. Excuse me, uh, Wendy, would you please name, give us your oh, name? Oh, I'm not so sure I would remember. <laughs> I'm Wendy Curto from St. John Speedway and I rise in support of this uh, resolution. I can't add anything to whether to the last two people that spoke, they were both excellent, but I wanted to rise publicly and say, yay. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you. Let's see, we still have a few more moments. I'm gonna um, call, recognize George Moore. George Moore, uh, St. John's Lafayette, uh, I rise to speak on behalf of the, uh, the resolution. Um, the, the only thing I want to point out here is that given the broad cross section of things that people can choose to do, um, there's also the support that is being offered, I think, by the UBE. And so there can also be guidance from that perspective for those who are who are seeking additional help. Great, thank you, George. The chair recognizes Evelyn Wheeler. Thank you, Evelyn, Evelyn Wheeler, Christ Church Madison. Um, I did send text to Kim, I just, threw in the words, uh, through such activities as. It is not clear from the language of that paragraph. Excuse it me, says, Evelyn? Yes, ma'am. Evelyn, thank you. We are I'm going to put the resolution on the screen so that people can see exactly how the resolution should read. I'm going to call on dispatch to read the resolution as you would like it amended, and then you may speak to it. Dispatch. As amended, the, the proposed amendment, amended resolution reads, resolved that this 183rd convention of the Episcopal Diocese of Indianapolis direct each congregation and diocesan ministry to report to the secretary of the diocese no later than August 31, 2021, the work that their congregation or ministry has done between November 2020 and August 2021 in dismantling racism through such activities as storytelling, community listening and engagement with civic organizations and partner religious institutions and be it further, et cetera. 
Thank you. Is there a second to the amendment? I'll be looking in the chat for a second. Yes. There is a second. Thank you very much. Evelyn Wheeler, would you please speak to your amendment? Yes, thank you, Evelyn Wheeler, Christchurch, Madison. Um, I know I know that um, Father Gray has told us this is a, a suggested list, but the resolution says directs. The diocese directs each congregation to report on how what they've done to dismantle systemic racism through storytelling, community listening, and engagement with civic organizations and partner religious institutions. And those are all fantastic suggestions. Father Gray has also said to us that this is a suggested list. And that is why I am proposing the amendment to say such activities as to make it clear that we are not directed to do all five of those things, that, that whichever ones we pick, or if we pick other ones, that we are still engaged in following the direction of the diocese in working to dismantle systemic racism. Thank you. Thank you. There's an amendment on the floor. It's been properly um, moved and seconded. Is there a discussion? Seeing that there are no hands being raised for discussing this amendment, it would appear that we are prepared to vote on the amendment. I'm gonna ask that we place that amendment back on the screen one more time briefly as I call on uh, Canon Brendan O'Sullivan Hale to lead us in the vote on this amendment. Thank you, Bishop. You have the amendment on the screen. Give me just a moment to get you to the poll. Great, thank you very much. Hey, you, uh, as a reminder, you are voting on the amendment, not the main motion. Please vote now. The vote will remain open for 10 more seconds. The vote is closed. Thank you. The chair calls on dispatch. The, uh, by a vote of 127 for versus 17 against, the resolution as amended carries, or excuse me, the amendment carries. Thank you. We now have before us the resolution as amended. Is there any further discussion? The chair recognizes Debbie, Debbie Dealer. Debbie Daler, you may um, be unmuted. There you go. Hey, I'm Debbie Daler. I'm the rector at St. Albans in Indianapolis. I don't know that this is a major thing, but I just am wondering about some of the capitalization that could happen in the re in the resolution itself. Uh, capitalizing the word white, capitalizing the word black, um, capitalizing alt right and supremacy. Some things that might identify more titles rather than um, just basic words. Um, I've already sent the information to Kim. So to be clear, are you, rec are you um, rising to offer amendments to this resolution? In the I'm not sure if, it's, if it needs to be or if it does. I, I, I'm not sure because it's about capitalizations and I don't know if that's, a, if that's an amendment or if it, or if it isn't. If someone can give me clarity on that, that'd be great. I'm going to call on Brendan, o Brendan O'Sullivan Hale, knowing that there was no such thing as a friendly amendment, but these are not <laughs> substantive changes, although capitalizations are actually quite substantive in the current debate. I'm going to ask for a ruling that he might be able to provide from parliamentary procedure about how to proceed. 
Bishop, notwithstanding the fact that capitalizations do carry certain weight right now, um, I would recommend that this be treated as an edit as an editorial change be dealt with in final edit rather than consume the time of the convention floor. The chair finds that ruling satisfactory. Does that work for you, Debbie? Dale? It, it is just fine. I just thought I would. I wanted to ask the question. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Is there any other discussion on the resolution as amended? All right, I think we are, um, I'm receiving the signal that we are prepared to vote. And that signal just being that there are no hands raised or any other motions of folks wanting to speak. We are prepared to vote on this resolution number two as amended, I will call on Ken and Brendan to conduct the vote. Thank you, Bishop. The matter before convention is the resolution as amended. Please vote now. The vote will remain open for 10 more seconds. The vote is closed. Thank you. The chair calls on dispatch. Uh, by a vote of 139 for and seven against excuse me, 140 for the uh, um, resolution as amended versus eight against, opposed, uh, the resolution as amended carries. Great, thank you. And thank you all for your, um, both the work on both of these resolutions and for the spirit and substance of the debate as we work through them. It's much, much appreciated for our ongoing health and life as a diocese. The chair recognizes this dispatch of business for our next order of business. The next order of business is resolution three to recognize Project Home Indy as a cooperating ministry. This resolution is proposed by executive council. This resolution was received after the filing deadline Therefore, it must be treated as a resolution from the floor. That means before we can begin discussing the resolution, the convention must agree to permit the discussion. Without objection, we now proceed to a vote to permit the resolution be to be considered by convention. Thank you, Bishop. Matter before convention is whether this resolution can be considered. So the vote you're about to take is whether we are allowed to talk about this resolution. You are not voting for or against the resolution at this time. Please vote now. Voting will remain open for 10 more seconds. The vote is closed. Chair recognizes dispatch for the results of the vote. Thank you, Bishop. By a vote of 130 in favor versus 14 against, the, the decision to consider the resolution carries. The chair recognizes Hillary Cook to speak to the resolution. Thank you, Bishop. I'd like to invite Brendan O'Sullivan Hale and Julia Whitworth to speak to this resolution. Chair recognizes Brendan O'Sullivan Hale and Julia Whitworth. The um, resolution that Executive Council proposes is to recognize uh, Project Home Indy as an affiliated institution of the Diocese of Indianapolis known as a cooperating ministry. That affiliation does not make uh, this organization a unit of the Diocese of Indianapolis. Rather, we affirm 
that the uh, mission of Project uh, Home Indy, which uh, Julia Whitworth will address in a moment, um, is congruent with the mission pillars of the Diocese of Indianapolis. And furthermore, that there is mutual benefit uh, by the affiliation uh, by uh, Project Home Indy being able to provide its employees uh, certain benefits, namely uh, health insurance and retirement benefits uh, at a cost that is affordable to them. And from the standpoint of the Diocese of Indianapolis, not only do we get to further the um, ability of this organization to execute uh, its goals, um, but also because the um, populations of cooperating ministries tend to be a bit younger. Um, it improves the, improves the demographics uh, of our insurance pool um, and so should help keep down the rise in insurance premiums over time. Um, I'll ask uh, at this point um, Reverend Julia Whitworth to continue uh, to discuss Project Homes Indy's mission and uh, partnership with Trinity Indianapolis. Thank you, Canon Brendan, and thank you, Bishop. I'm Julia Whitworth, Rector of Trinity Indy. It's my privilege to speak in support of the resolution and of Project Home Indy, a campus ministry partner of Trinity Episcopal Church in Indianapolis. For almost 10 years, Project Home Indy, or PHI, has provided holistic trauma-informed care for teen mothers and their children in a transitional residential facility on Trinity's campus. At any time, Project Home Indy provides safe housing for up to 18 months for five young mothers aged 14 to 19 and their babies in a house provided at no cost by our parish. With a mission to break cycles of homelessness, abuse, and poverty, PHI also provides maternal fetal health counseling and parenting counseling, life skills training, education support, child care, basic needs, and safe haven to allow young women under tremendously adverse circumstances to learn the skills necessary to thrive independently. Trinity is proud to have partnered with PHI since its institutional incubation over 12 years ago. At this time, access to diocesan health and retirement benefits will be pivotal as they seek to attract the most qualified social workers and to provide just and ample support to their hardworking staff. Moreover, deepening and making visible the ties of the diocese to this excellent not-for-profit falls squarely within the scope of our mission to serve as beacons of Christ, to offer a generous invitation and welcome to stand with the vulnerable and marginalized and to connect with one another and the world. The Diocese of Indianapolis in Southern and Central Indiana has a remarkable legacy of innovation and passion for justice, especially in its development of and continuing support to impactful not-for-profit outreach partners, including the Damien Center, the Julian Center, John P. Crane House, Alternatives Inc., Day Spring Center, and most recently, Trinity Haven. Collectively, these institutions support people living with HIV AIDS, survivors of domestic and sexual violence, women rebuilding their lives after incarceration, families experiencing homelessness, and LGBTQ youth at risk of homelessness. I encourage you to support this resolution and welcome Project Home Indy into this excellent community of this diocese and its cooperating ministries. By doing so, you will demonstrate to some of God's most vulnerable beloved, homeless children who themselves have children, that the Episcopal Church stands with them. Thank you. Thank you. So the resolution is on the floor. It comes from a committee that our council does not require a second. Is there a further discussion? The chair recognizes C. Davies Reed. I see Davies Reed, the rector of St. Francis in the Fields in Zionsville. Uh, and there is a, a small uh, budget consequence to this. The uh, cooperating ministries uh, receive $1,000 from the diocese in the annual budget. Uh, and that helps create the financial linkage that legitimizes the access to the benefits which they're seeking and which will benefit everybody. 
Um, it's not in the current draft of the 2021 budget, but the thousand dollars I think will easily be found. But just in, with regard to transparency, I thought that ought to be known. So if you want to know, I'm for it. Thank you, C. Davies, and for the point of information. The chair recognizes Sally Hardgrove. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sally Hardgrove from uh, Trinity, Indianapolis, and I uh, rise in, in favor of this resolution. Having been through a tour of the facility, uh, I, I just have been incredibly impressed by the safety measures that are taken, 24-7 adult social worker coverage inside the home. Um, and I'm sure that they're not paid tremendously well and having uh, access to benefits at reduced cost really is a, um, uh, a benefit that will help attract the best that they can to bring to this home and break the cycle. Um, I really do, do believe this is uh, the, a, a good thing to do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, it would appear that we are prepared to vote. The chair calls on Brendan O'Sullivan Hale to conduct the vote. Thank you, Bishop. The matter is resolution number three. Please vote now. Oh, it just went away. Oh. It just disappeared. Uh, hang on. Let's. Adventures in Zoom. Let's try this again. <laughs> there it is. Voting will remain open for 10 more seconds. Voting is now closed. Thank you. The chair calls on dispatch for the results. By a vote of 143-4 and three votes against, the resolution carries. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you and welcome Project Home Indy. So delighted. It's a, such an important ministry and I just commend it as um, a part of the long legacy has been mentioned of changing real lives in our diocese. So wonderful thing. Saints, we are probably at a good point to take a break. <laughs> and so I'm going to invite you to take a 10 minute break. I have 3.05 Eastern time by my clock. I'm gonna ask if um, we can bear it to come back at 3.15, 10 minute break. When we return, we'll be on the downslope of our convention business with a long, beautiful ride of canonical changes. So take a stretch, grab some chocolate, great, take a break, get some water, and then we'll see you back in 10 minutes. We're in recess.
Tak. The chair calls on dispatch of business for our next order of business. Copies of canon changes can be found on the diocesan website. The matter before the convention is the change to canon two. The chair calls on Todd Relu, chair of the constitution and canons committee to speak to the amendment. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, as you said, the matter before the convention is the change to canon two. Committees of convention, I call on canon Brendan O'Sullivan Hale to summarize the canon change. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, just as a general note about all of the canons, uh, what we're changing in Canon 2 will apply to a lot here, is that as we started on the project of amending some of the meteor canons that were required as a result of what we did in 2018, namely Canons 9 and 10, we found a great deal of low-hanging fruit elsewhere in the canons, largely clean up. Uh, so the change to Canon 2 effectively is to conform some of the practices of um, of convention to the canon, or rather the canon to the practice. The most substantive thing that's happening in canon two, however, is the, uh, bear with me, in section E, uh, which extends the time uh, that it is permitted for a, a canonical change or a constitutional amendment to come before the convention. Uh, under a current practice, there is a hard 60 day deadline, um, which generally uh, based on when our convention falls happens right about um, Labor Day or a little bit before. Um, and this provides uh, a little bit more flexibility for a constitution or canon amendment uh, to come in 30 days prior to convention, subject to the review of the constitution and canons committee, which can uh, decline to advance uh, the change if it is not um, up to snuff. Thank you. Is there discussion? We're looking for the raise hand feature to call on you and recognize you. And if you would like to speak for or against this change, please identify yourself, name your church and the reason for rising. Give it another moment. Appears that we are ready to vote. The chair recognizes Brendan O'Sullivan Hale to conduct the voting. Matter before convention is the amendment of Canon 2. Please vote now. Voting will remain open for 10 more seconds. The vote is closed. Thank you. The chair recognizes dispatch for the results of the vote. Thank you, Bishop. By a vote of 127 for and two against, the uh, change to Canon 2 carries. Great. Thank you. The vote carries. The chair recognizes dispatch of business for the next order of business. Thank you, Bishop. The matter before convention is the, cha ca the change to Canon 5.4. The chair calls on Todd Relu, chair of the Constitution and Canons Committee to speak to the amendment. Yes, the matter before convention is the change to Canon 5.4, appointments by the Bishop of Advisory Officers and Committees. I call on Canon Brennan and Sullivan Hale to summarize the Canon change. Thank you, Todd. There are three principal things this change to the canon does. The first is that there is a peculiar relic in this portion of the canons um, that places uh, the women's ministries of the diocese under the authority of the bishop. As near as we can tell, the reason for this um, is that uh, at least one or more prior bishop preferred to keep women's ministries in their place, as it were. Um, the removal of the mention of these ministries from the canons in no way diminishes the work that they do. It merely um, emphasizes that the good work of these ministries does not rely on them receiving the permission or oversight of the bishop. Uh, 
The second uh, major change is in the composition of the Mission Strategy Committee. In her address to the convention during worship, Bishop Jennifer discussed an invigoration of that committee and an adjustment to its mission. The changes here do two big things. One is it streamlines uh, the composition of the committee, uh, allowing uh, for um, a more nimble group of people, as well as providing the bishop with greater flexibility as to the composition of the committee. It also uh, provides a mandate for that committee that is more consistent with the current needs of the church. The last item has to do with the uh, investment and finance committee. The biggest thing that is put in there is uh, it introduces terms for investment and finance committee members. Uh, the uh, existing canon allows them to serve in perpetuity. Um, the main purpose of offering the terms is not so much to limit the terms themselves, uh, but as to uh, make it clearer that when the bishop asks you to join that committee, um, that it is not a life sentence uh, that you may in fact step off gracefully after three years. It also assigns the investment and finance committee um, the responsibility of developing a gift acceptance policy for the diocese, which it does not currently have. Thank you, Ken and Brendan. Is there discussion? I see no hands coming. Give it one more moment. Looks like we are prepared to vote. Chair recognizes Brendan O'Sullivan Hale to conduct the voting. The matter before the convention is uh, Canon 5, Section 4. Please vote now. The vote will close in 10 seconds. The vote is closed. Thank you. The chair recognizes dispatch for the results of the vote. Thank you, Bishop. By a vote of 140 to 1, the change to the canon carries. The amendment carries. Thank you very much. The chair calls on dispatch for our next order of business. Thank you, Bishop. The matter before the convention is the change to canon 8.4b. The chair calls on Todd Relu, chair of the Constitution and Canons Committee, to speak to the amendment. Thank you, Bishop. Matter before the convention is a change to Canon 8.4b, outdated language regarding duties of the Standing Committee. I call on Canon Brennan O'Sullivan Hale to summarize the Canon change. Thank you, Todd. Uh, this is a simple removal of a paragraph that no longer applies. It had to do with a staggering of standing committee terms at a particular point in time that is now long past. It just removes clutter from the canon. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> if <laughs> I love our canon. <laughs> Brendan, because removing clutter from canons is such a beautiful turn of phrase. I just couldn't hold that together. Is there discussion? Looks like we are prepared to vote. I will call. Thank you, Brendan. Uh, it appears um, that not everything in our canons sparks joy, um, or so we shall discover. Um, when we relaunch the poll now. <laughs> the vote will close in five seconds. The vote is closed. The chair calls on dispatch to give the results of the vote. Thank you, Bishop. By a unanimous vote of 136 members, uh, canon, the, the amendment to remove the clutter from Canon 8.4B uh, carries. <laughs> so much joy. Thank you all. OK. <laughs> We're going to continue with, these, um, with the work. And so I'm going to call 
on dispatch of business for our next order of business. The matter before the convention is the change to Canon 9. The chair calls on Todd Relu, chair of the Constitution and Canons Committee, to speak to the amendment. Thank you, Bishop. The matter before the convention is the change to Canon 9, the role of executive council and outdated language regarding deaneries. I call on uh, Canon Brendan O'Sullivan Hale to summarize the Canon change. Thank you, Todd. This canon change and the next one are probably the most uh, substantive of the ones that we will deal with today. These are the ones that were necessitated by the 2018 decision of the diocesan convention to shift to the neighborhood structure, a new way of doing joint mission together, um, and, as well as governance. So that has uh, two big impacts uh, on us. One has to do with the composition of executive council, uh, which is what the bulk of the strike throughs um, and new language here uh, deal with. Also in 2018, uh, what was expressed in the intention of convention uh, was a somewhat broader mandate for executive council beyond uh, simply sort of the temporal affairs of the diocese and more clearly um, assigning some responsibility to the uh, missional spiritual affairs uh, of the diocese as well. Additionally, this change um, addresses an issue that some of the uh, deaneries in rural areas uh, have experienced, uh, namely that in those areas, uh, there may be only a few clergy uh, or none. Uh, and uh, so if there are no clergy ready, uh, excuse me, willing or able to serve as executive council representatives, or if they have just had enough of perpetual executive council service, um, it is permissible for a lay person to be elected uh, to fill a clergy term uh, subject to the next time uh, that uh, term comes open, essentially a clergy person uh, has the right to run uh, if one is willing and able to do so. This addresses the problem of underrepresentation on executive council uh, of our more rural deaneries. Um, and so it's a, it's a fairness issue uh, that uh, we're addressing, dealing with here. Thank you, Canon Brendan. Is there a discussion? Let's see, seeing none. I know we're getting pretty nimble with our fingers here, so I'm going to take that to mean that we are prepared to vote. And so I will uh, call on Canon Brendan to conduct the voting. Thank you, Bishop. The matter before convention is the amendment to. Canon nine, please vote now. The vote will remain open for 10 more seconds. The vote is closed. Thank you. The chair recognizes dispatch for the results of the vote. Thank you, Bishop. By a vote of 135 to one, the amendment to Canon 9 carries. Wonderful, amendment carries. Dispatch, what is our next order of business? Bishop, thank you. The matter before the convention is the change to Canon 10. The chair calls on Todd Relu, Chair of Constitution and Canons Committee to speak to the amendment. Thank you, Bishop, the matter before the convention is the change to Canon 10, which replaces the language of deaneries with the language of neighborhoods. I call on Canon Brendan O'Sullivan Hale to summarize the canon change. Thank you, Todd. In many respects, what is happening in this canon is the word deanery is being struck out and replaced with neighborhoods. More substantively, however, uh, there is a uh, change that happens to the purpose of the neighborhood meetings. There are two things to notice. First, the spring meeting, uh, which was made optional at a convention some years back, uh, is once again um, made mandatory that the neighborhoods are expected now to meet uh, twice per year. Uh, but you will also notice a significant expansion uh, in what those meetings are for. They are not uh, merely for the matters of uh, discussing the budget or um, legislation coming to uh, executive council, or excuse me, to diocesan convention, which uh, is their current stated purpose, um, but also for uh, prayer, spiritual formation, uh, and uh, mutual ministry in uh, each neighborhood's geographic area. Thank you, Canon Brendan. Is there a discussion? Okay. 
Okay. Seeing none, it looks like we are prepared to vote. Uh, so I recognize I Brendan. Do we have um, a hand? Oh, there we go. Thank you. I appreciate that. The chair recognizes uh, Brooke Renee Bonnell. Uh, hi, my name is Brooke Renee Bonnell from Muncie, Indiana. Uh, just a clarification, and it may be in there, um, but I haven't read every word of of it. So I just want a clarification. Um, is there any provision for the ability for people in the neighborhood group to meet electronically if people cannot drive to get to the meeting itself? Uh, Ken and Brendan, might you address that? Thank you. Uh, this will be addressed in a subsequent uh, canon amendment, uh, which will make um, electronic meetings universally permissible to do diocesan business. So this canon doesn't address it, but it's coming. Thank you. Is there any more discussion? All right, then I think we are prepared to vote. Ken and Brendan. Matter before convention is Canon 10. Are the amendment there too? Please vote now. The vote will remain open for 10 more seconds. The vote is closed. Thank you, Canon Brendan. Dispatch. Thank you, Bishop. By a vote of 136 to two, the amendment to Canon 10 carries. Thank you, vote carries. Dispatch. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Bishop. The matter before the convention is the change to Canon 19.2. The chair calls on Todd Relu, chair of Constitution and Canons Committee to speak to the amendment. Thank you, Bishop. The matter before the convention is a change to Canon 19.2, changing the filing date of parochial reports. I call on Canon Brendan O'Sullivan Hale to summarize the Canon change. Thank you, Todd. This Canon change does two things. One, it changes the uh, canonical due date of parochial reports in this diocese from February 1st to March 1st, uh, which is a more realistic deadline uh, for most um, congregations to achieve. Uh, additionally, it clarifies that filing the parochial report online is equivalent to sending the parochial report to um, the office. There's been um, a bit of confusion on that point, so we just want to make it absolutely clear that if you file your report online, you have done everything you have to do. Thank you, Ken and Brendan. Is there discussion? All right, looks like we are prepared to vote. Ken and Brendan. Thank you. The matter before the convention is the amendment to Canon 19. Please vote now. The vote will remain open for 10 seconds. The vote is closed. Chair recognizes dispatch for the results. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, the diocese is favorable about changing the due date of par parochial reports and by unanimous vote of 139 people, excuse me, 139 people, uh, the amendment carries to Canon 19.2. Thank you. Chair calls on dispatch for the next Order of business. Thank you, Bishop. The matter before convention is the change to Canon 20.16. Chair calls on Todd Relu, Chair of the Constitution and Canons Committee, to speak to the amendment. Thank you, Bishop. The matter before the convention is a change to Canon 20.16, or yeah, Canon 20, Section 16, which uh, was set up for Moss Committee or Moss uh, congregations, it was intended to provide a more flexible governance structure for Episcopal communities of faith, uh, but it's not being used. I call on Canon Brendan O'Sullivan Hale to summarize the canon change. 
Thank you, Todd. In conversation with some of the congregations uh, that we thought might benefit from this canon, um, we discovered um, a few, uh, three big reasons essentially uh, that congregations were deciding not to use it. Um, so the first is that uh, communities organized under this canon are subject to unusual scrutiny by diocesan convention that other congregations are not subject to. Uh, they also felt that uh, they would be under annual threat of dissolution under the sole authority of the bishop. And they also responded negatively to the overall sense of the current canon um, that suggests managed decline uh, rather than possibilities for growth. It is notable that strategic scale um, in the uh, title of these uh, communities that the canon provides is a euphemism for small, and there is uh, a vision for growth here. There are a lot of technical moving parts um, that are happening uh, in this uh, canon, but here are a few things to know. One is that it puts uh, communities that organize under uh, this section of the canon on equivalent footing to um, other missions of this diocese. That is that uh, they are subject to the same scrutiny by a diocesan convention that other uh, missions are not additional scrutiny. Uh, dissolution is also only by the um, is only by the mutual consent of the bishop and the standing committee on identical terms to other missions. And the uh, overall sense of the canon uh, is that it can be used uh, not only for uh, congregations where the trappings of a vestry and so forth simply aren't practical for governance, uh, but can also be a launching point for new ministries. That is, um, that these are places that uh, we can see experimentation uh, and uh, and growth. It also clarifies exactly how you go about uh, organizing this way. Uh, and finally uh, notes that the only special, special scrutiny to which such, an organ uh, such a community would be subject is that their bylaws would be subject to the approval of the Mission Strategy Committee. Thank you, Ken and Brendan. Is there discussion? Doesn't appear to be anyone coming to raise hands in the Zoom room. So it may be that we're prepared to vote. Ken and Brendan, would you conduct the vote, please? The matter before the convention <coughs> is Canon 20, Section 16. Please vote now. The vote will remain open for 10 seconds. The vote is closed. Thank you, Canon Brendan. Dispatch for the results. Thank you, Bishop. By a vote of 136 to 2, the change to Canon 20, Section 16 carries. Thank you. The amendment carries. And I now call on dispatch for our next order of business. Thank you, Bishop. The matter before the convention is the change to Canon 27. The chair calls on Todd Relu. Chair of the Constitution and Canons Committee to speak to the amendment. Thank you, Bishop. The matter before the convention is a change to Canon 27, allowing remote meetings and electronic voting for diocesan business. I call on Canon Brendan O'Sullivan Hale to summarize the Canon change. Uh, I believe that Todd Relu has just adequately summarized the Canon change. Uh, <coughs> electronic voting and uh, electronic meetings would be permissible under this Canon. Is there discussion? Seems that we are prepared to vote. Oh, the chair recognizes C. Davies Reed. Uh, I did have a, it makes a point of clarification. Since this is a canon change at the diocesan level, does this then apply to all congregations? Um. Uh, I think what you asked me to do is identify myself. C. Davies Reed, Director of St. Francis in Zionsville. You. You're on mute, Kristen. Oh. 
You see how we need this cannon? <laughs> <laughs> the training um, part of it too. I'm going to uh, defer this to, um, uh, I rec the chair recognizes our Chancellor George Plews. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you, Brendan. Um, my opinion will be that it, it doesn't, it, it this, the canons apply there, the canonical life together, but not to individual parishes. But many parishes have their own sets of bylaws and they need to look at those to see. See, this might well be a good model to follow to, to allow those kind of meetings, but I, would, I wouldn't want to leave a conflict in place if there is one now. Appreciate that clarification. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? I think we are prepared to vote. Canon Brendan. Matter before convention is the amendment to Canon 27. <coughs> Please vote now. The vote will be open for 10 more seconds. <clears throat> the vote is closed. Thank you. The chair recognizes dispatch for the results of the vote. Thank you, Bishop. By unanimous vote of 140 people, the amendment to Canon 27 carries. Wonderful. Thank you. Dispatch. Thank you, Bishop. The matter before the convention is the change to Canon 30. The chair calls on Todd Relu to speak to the amendment. Thank you, Bishop. The matter before the convention is the change to Canon 30, which will allow parishes, parishes without clergy to have representation for nominated positions, and it clarifies the information needed when a floor nomination is made. I call on Canon Brendan O'Sullivan Hale to summarize the Canon change. Thank you, Todd. The revision to this canon um, uh, corrects an inadvertent um, structure of the canons, which assumes that all congregations have clergy um, and that those clergy would approve uh, who is eligible to run for diocesan office. Um, so uh, that is naturally a huge problem for congregations without clergy, of which we have um, quite a few. Uh, but the members of those congregations are members in full standing of this church, uh, and this uh, revision to the canon clarifies that. In addition, it also clarifies a procedure for nominations from the floor so that the diocesan convention uh, can make an informed vote. Looks like we are prepared to vote. Canon Brendan, conduct the vote, please. Matter before convention is the amendment to Canon 30. Please vote now. <clears throat> vote will be open, 10 more seconds. The vote is closed. Chair calls on dispatch for the results of the vote. Thank you, Bishop. And this, what I believe is the last of our canonical revisions uh, by a vote of 139 to one, the amendment to Canon, canon 30 carries. Excellent, amendment carries. And um, just a note of deep gratitude for our Constitution and Canons Committee to Todd for chairing it and for all and for Brendan O'Sullivan Hale and his work to help us Kanmari the <laughs> canons. <laughs> Deeply important and necessary work. Deep, deep gratitude on, on behalf of our diocese. And again, as a reminder that this work continues and will continue to be um, more substantive, substantive as we move into other canonical revisions that will come to us at our next convention in 2021. And now for something different, <laughs> the chair recognizes Laurel Cornell for the treasures report. Thank you, Bishop. My name is Laurel Cornell. I'm the treasurer for the diocese. 
This means I'm a layperson and a volunteer, and I'm a member of Christchurch Cathedral. The Treasurer's Report is online at Reports. I hope you've read it and thought about it. I'll identify the major topics of the report, say a bit about two of them, and then ask for your questions. The Treasurer's Report is based on two documents, the financial statement for the month ended September 30th, 2020, and the third quarter performance summary of our investments, also dated September 30th. In the Treasurer's Report, I discuss nine topics, pandemic, income, expenses, financial situation, the proposed 2021 budget, the activities of the Investment and Finance Committee, the Revolving Loans Fund, the Audit, and the Personnel Policy and Compensation Committee. And then under income, I talk about three topics, apportionment, the endowment, and fundraising. Again, if you haven't read this yet, please do so. There are two topics in this report that I'd like to highlight the response to the pandemic, and the value of us having an endowment. So about the pandemic, beginning in March, under the very able leadership of Canon for Administration and Evangelism, Brendan O'Sullivan Hale, the diocese undertook several strategies to make sure that all 48 of our congregations survive the panic, pandemic whole and healthy. Executive Council approved two revisions to the 2020 budget. These allowed apportionment relief to congregations that needed it and changed allocations of funds within the budget. The principal change was to move funds from other line items and create an emergency fund of about $220,000 available for emergency aid to congregations. The diocese also applied for and received a Paycheck Protection Program loan of $203,000. This early and conservative strategy has served us very well this year. As of the most recent diocesan financial statement, the budget is in balance and there is no stress on diocesan cash flow. However, given the amount of unemployment created by pandemic losses, we expect that 2021 will impose greater financial difficulties on our congregations, and we plan uh, to think about how we will respond to them. As for the endowment, as a diocese, we are extremely fortunate to have a sizable endowment. It's a pool of funds whose earnings provide a source of income to us for over the long term. As Ken and Kristen White emphasized in the neighborhood meetings, having an endowment enables us to provide service to our congregations that no other diocese provides. The Diocese of Indianapolis pays for health insurance coverage for clergy and their families. This means that individual congregations do not have to cover this quite substantial expense. Without it, each congregation would need to add about $30,000 to their budget every year for each clergy person they employ. So it really makes a difference to congregations. One of the principal activities of the Investment and Finance Committee this year is reviewing a report prepared by committee member Norm Callahan entitled, Risks to the Diocese Unrestricted Fund from Current Investment and Withdrawal Practices. Financially astute members of the diocese have known for a decade that the diocese has been withdrawing funds for operating expenses at a rate that is too high. This report provides the details. Our responsibility as stewards is both to use the unrestricted fund for our current operating expenses and to preserve its value so that it will provide income for us and our successors in future decades. So what do we need to do as a diocese? What we need to do as a diocese is we need to learn to talk about our good fortune so that we can be financially prudent in good times while also being able generously to accomplish our mission in bad times. Finally, I would like to thank all who contribute to the financial work of the diocese. I especially want to thank the members of the Investment and Finance Committee, Norm Callahan, John Denson, Laura Dreyer, Steve Fales, Tom Hondreich, 
Isaiah Cook, Max Nottingham, George Plews, and C. Davies Reed. Thank you. Thank you, Laurel. The chair will now recognize Laurel Cornell and the Reverend C. Davies Reed for the presentation of the 2021 budget. Thank you. Do we need to receive the treasurer's report before we do the budget or do we do it all at the same time? Let us do it all at the same time. <laughs> That's said in such a churchy way. Let us do it all at the same time. <laughs> what can well, I tell you? <laughs> at this point, uh, I know that everybody's seen the budget at least twice. And, um, and that's a good thing. And thanks, just let me just start by thanking the members of the Budget Formation Committee because I, I get called out as chair all the time, but uh, you just heard a, a wonderful report from Laurel Cornell, our treasurer who participates, Laura Dreyer, Steve Fales, Roseanne Grasty, Max Nineham, Greg Staub, and of course, uh, Ken Brennan O'Sullivan Hale, who does the yeoman's part of lifting. And I assure you that there's no clutter in this budget and it will bring you sparkling joy. Um, the budget is in balance. It's about three and a half million dollars. Uh, it is less than 2019, 2020, and it is less than 2019 even. So um, we are trying to be as responsible as we possibly can be in, uh, in spending. One of the things to keep in mind when we look at the 2021 budget is the amount of work that went in during 2020 to provide uh, slack so that uh, congregations could continue to thrive. Laurel talked about that, uh, and, I, and I just am so impressed with the work that happened in 2020. So uh, the highlights, and in this I'll make this brief, apportionment, same as last year, 14%. Draw from endowment, we're holding that at 5%, second year in a row. And what you're going to learn as you, as you read the report that Laurel provided through Norm's work, Norm Callahan's work, is that 5% is too high. Uh, we need to be closer to four and a half percent if we are going to maintain a perpetual endowment, which is what we have. Uh, so we need to get real serious about uh, getting that number even lower. Sorry to say. Um, because of the pandemic and other forces on the budget, diocesan staff salaries are frozen this year. Um, but we, we are looking forward to some wonderful opportunities. Uh, one is more in-person activities. We're trying to be optimistic about that which includes more travel, hopefully for diocesan staff particularly, and some major initiatives, including the College for Congregational Development and the presiding bishop's visit next year at convention. So hold that in your prayers. Uh, you heard uh, the wonderful benefit of a portion of our health insurance being paid for from the diocese. Uh, that is 78% uh, this year. So 22% is being paid for by the employee. Uh, and because the, we've held as many things flat as we can, we are not going to increase that to 23% this year. We're gonna hold it flat at 22. Some of you will remember that we were working over a 10 year cycle to go from 15% to 25%. Well, we're gonna hold it at 22% for one more, one more year. And I would remind you uh, to, uh, either get it yourself or, or check in with your clergy people to make sure they get their annual physical because any clergy person who gets their physical can get a 1% rebate on their cost share. And that's actually money in your pocket. So get busy with that. Um, one of the things that you'll notice is a continuation of the reorganization of the budget. The budget looks a lot more like our principles now, the five points that we can all name and, and have memorized. Uh, you'll see that we put the work of the diocese essentially into those five areas. There are a couple of areas of the budget that don't quite fit. There's an administrative section. So we uh, pulled those things out. But it's, I think it's lovely the way in which we now say, what is important to us? Well, look at our budget. This is what's important to us. And how do we know it's important? Because it directly funds our mission. The money directly funds the points of our mission. So it doesn't get much better than that. Uh, let's see. Already talked about that. 
really trying to make this the highlight reel because I know you know a lot of this. In fact, I'm gonna stop with that and see if there are any questions because I think we've been pretty good about sharing this information along. Uh, if there are any particular questions uh, or if Laurel, you'd like to add anything to this uh, or of course, Brendan, as the, as the guy who pushed all the buttons, I, uh, in, I invite your uh, input. Oh, and we submit this for approval by the, the body, yeah. That's right. So if there is no um, additions from Laurel or Brendan, I will um, open it up for discussion. Is there discussion on the 2021 budget? Sorry, Sean, no slideshow this year. Chair recognizes Frank Apichake. Thank you, Bishop. Just a, a word of gratitude for, uh, I can't imagine what the 2020 budget going back and forth and then planning the 2021. Uh, just, I know it's a lot of work that we don't see. So thank you all for, for doing that. Thanks, Frank. Thank you, that's Frank from St. Matthews, Indianapolis. Is there any other discussion? Frank. All right, um, if there's no discussion, it looks like we might be prepared to vote. Just a note on the earlier request regarding the treasurer's report. That report is a report to convention and is not one that needs to be filed for audit. Those reports are taken care of during the regular meetings of the executive council. So what you'll be voting on right now is the 2021 budget as presented. And then being no further discussion, I'll invite Ken and Brendan to conduct the voting. Thank you, Bishop. Matter before convention is the 2021 budget as presented. Please vote now. The vote will be open for 10 more seconds. The vote is closed. Thank you, Canon Brendan. Dispatch. Thank you, Bishop. By a vote of 135 in favor to three opposed, the 2021 budget for the Diocese of Indianapolis is approved. Thank you. And I will affirm and um, just amplify the gratitude of the work of those who have been super nimble and responsive in our financial affairs this year. And as we look towards 2021 with hope, we have a budget that reflects that and also is faithful and, res and um, just responsive to our need to be good stewards. So thank you all. The moment you all have been waiting for, I now call on Hillary Cook for a courtesy resolution. <laughs> Thank you, Bishop. I just wanna say there are no words to adequately thank everyone, particularly in this COVID pandemic year, but words are all we have. So this is what we've got. Um, Brendan, do you have the, is the slide available? Our technical team will bring it up. Okay, moment. great, thanks. Your face was just the one that I could see right in my screen. So that's why I called on you. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, resolved that the 183rd Convention of the Diocese of Indianapolis express deep appreciation to all those who have worked countless hours to make this convention a meaningful time of connection to the talented and indefatigable diocesan staff who provide unfailing support and compassion to the entire diocesan household to the inimitable Canon Stephanie Spellers, who is a beacon of Christ's light for us as we learn to be beacons of Christ in the world. To Jeff Brinkman and Susan Steigerwald, who are virtually the best co-chairs a convention could have. To Canticle Communications and Underwood Production, Under Production Media, without whom it would not have been possible for us to gather in this new way. To Patrick Burke, Kendall Ludwig, and all those bringing us together in worship. To Holly Rankin-Zare for organizing our convention workshops 
and to our workshop presenters and technology hosts, including Stephanie Spellers, Kristen White, Brendan O'Sullivan Hale, Catherine Meeks, Aaron Walter, Melissa Rao, Kathleen Moore, Roger Hutchinson, Kathy Scott, Rebecca Swit Sims, and Laura Dreyer. And to Lauren Easterling, Lee Little, and all our convention volunteers, without whose generous gifts of time and talent, we could not have had convention. Here ends the resolution. <laughs> Thank you. Is there a second? There are oh, many seconds. <laughs> and I think um, this is one of those resolutions where I will not call on Ken and Brendan, but I would like to ask for the passing of this resolution with applause. And so wherever you are, thank you all for this resolution. And I, no one's going to vote against that one, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Thank you, uh, Hillary, for um, crafting that resolution. And amen and amen to all who have made this convention possible. The chair recognizes dispatch Thank for you. announcements. Announcements, announcements, <laughs> announcements. Because we missed Way Cross, I had to say it. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, just a word to you all. Thank you for being here today. I wanted to let you know that evaluations will be emailed to everyone who registered this year and a recording of convention will be available soon on our website. And those are the only two announcements that I have. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you all. The last thing I need to say to you today is that the 184th convention will be held, God please, November 12th, and 13th, 2021 at the Embassy Suites in Plainfield, Indiana. Our presiding bishop will be our guest speaker as he makes his visitation to our diocese. And so with that, the 183rd convention of the Episcopal Diocese of Indianapolis is closed. Mm -hmm. <laughs>